opening scriptures take us right into uh, this message today. It's just amazing. Oftentimes, and then what Frank you shared, uh, you know, I want to encourage you that uh, every week I do my very best uh, to give you the very best because uh, it's an education to be a real priest so that you can be a king, uh, really sitting on a throne um, and really given charge over a whole city. That's what the Lord promises every one of us. And so even the song reflects, we we are just, we can even come boldly, right? Uh, even the scriptures, Hebrews 10, we can come boldly. Now, we all, uh, we all have our own whatever uh, struggles and challenges. And, and so that's why the prodigal son, this parable that we will go into, very rich parable, uh, takes us right into uh, our calling. And despite our circumstances, despite our struggles, uh, our shortcomings, our fears, our failures, and our little successes here and there, it is our calling. And so when we are in the body of Christ, that's where we are built up in the word of the Lord as a house of priests so that we can be put on the throne with the Lord Jesus. So as Paul's prophetic word tells us in Galatians chapter 3 into chapter 4, uh, that we, yeah, indeed can cry out to God, our Father, and know every one of us here uh, and within the body of Christ who can really like that good soil that was just read. We can take the word, and that's the word of the Son of God. Luke chapter 8 tells us in that same parable description, right? And to you belong the mysteries. In other words, the, the depths the much more uh, greater purposes of God. It's not just, uh, you know, some good to know knowledge and not need to know. It is necessary, deep, kingly knowledge. And so you are entitled to that. And, you know, while we have time, well, we can do that. Because especially in the last six months, you know, in the world, especially Europe and America, probably about 70 prominent situations of, of athletes, uh, even some of them world renowned, they just died, or they have severe sudden heart attack. Yesterday, Mr. Olympia 2018, 46 years old, he just died of heart attack. And earlier this week, uh, one of the ones that I enjoyed a relationship, a pastor in New Jersey, as I've told some of you, his heart just stopped on Monday. So uh, we are in that day where we are faced with a lot of challenges and and this period, especially where true kings must arise, true priesthood must arise, because there are many confusion. Uh, uh, there's much confusion and there's much uh, debates and much tensions in uh, the world. And much of it uh, is not seen because the media doesn't carry it. But right now, in many cities in America, in many cities in Europe, in Australia, and there are massive protests. Why? The heart is not at rest. There are issues that are not being publicly addressed. So we are kings and we are priests. And so, but what we can do, well, we are kept away from all this turmoil. Most people, you are kept away from this, but we have to sit at the feet of Jesus nevertheless. We have to continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so... Father, we come uh, with a fearful heart, respecting your word given to us by your son and which is the very word of life, which is your spirit. So may you continue to uh, grow us into his image, into his likeness, so that we can be truly kingly priests and priestly kings in your eternal kingdom, even right from this moment and especially when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ and given our reward. Amen. Now, the par par parable of the prodigal son, prodigal, the word means, there are two meanings, uh, one kind of good, one kind of not so good. All right, the not so good meaning is means wasteful, extravagant. And then the other good meaning is, means you're very generous, all right? So, so that's why uh, in recent years, this parable, a lot of teachers like to call them parable of the prodigal father because the father was so generous, right? Um, now, 
The Father is generous in his giving and in his forgiving. Previously, we have studied uh, how the king, as a merciful master, treated the two slaves. And uh, both could not really settle their accounts, and he was willing to forgive both of them, right? And today we begin to encounter a father who is stretched to the extremes by two quite dissimilar actions and attitudes of his two sons. He's got two sons, but they are very different in the way they think and the way they live out their life. And that's what it is in the family of God. We are different, but we need to learn our father. And for a starter, we are not going to reflect deeply into the bigger, biggest background that we uh, that we will go into, like the story uh, going back to the Old Testament, the story of, uh, you know, the people of God and the sto story of the people of God and Israel, and then the story of uh, the people of God as they stand in judgment. But we are going to reflect, kind of pull it together into our Christian calling for today. But next week and probably for two weeks, we will go deep into the Old Testament passages, and they're fascinating passages. But today we want to uh, reflect three important topics that's really central to our faith. That is, how do I trust God, who is my Jehovah Jireh, my provider? And how do I live my life reflecting the trust in God and also the faith passed down to me by my Father, not just my, by my Heavenly Father, but by all my spiritual fathers? going back to Abraham. Secondly, what kind of a relationship do I have with my Father in heaven? Is it a real and eternal spiritual relationship? Or is it just a kind of a religious faith kind of a relationship? This is a very serious question. And thirdly, uh, what about inheritance? Am I willing to wait and wait out Okay, so the word is should be wait out. Am I willing to wait out my rich inheritance in Christ? Wait out. Am I patiently waiting? Or am, am I eager just to get my inheritance right now? And we will get our inheritance when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us, every Jew, even today, also will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Most people don't know that. Why? Because... We see Jesus coming, and especially in the Gospel of John, how the Jews encountered him. And he said, look, I'm going to use the words of Moses to judge you too. Because they are encountered and they have the 39 books of the Bible, every Jew, maybe only 2 or 3% of Jews today in the world, whether in America or in the rest of the world or in the land of Israel, they, they believe that Jesus is their Messiah. Whether they believe or not, they're going to stand when they die. They pass on from this life, they stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. And every Christian too, we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But what about the people who are not Christians, who are not Jews? Well, they stand before the great white throne. That's in Revelation 20. So everyone who is dying, even right near to this moment, they either go before the judgment seat of Christ, if you're a Christian or you're a Jew, or you go before the great white throne judgment of God where the books of your life are looked and God decides. And of course, Jesus, and we know from what he's, he taught in Matthew 25, John 5, and what Paul talked in Romans 2, we know that those who lived according to their conscience to seek honor, glory, immortality, those who are kind, uh, will the name will be found in the book of life. So they will not be thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Right? Thrown in the lake of fire means you're totally gone, which is the second death. First death is the death of Adam, where God is still there in the midst. His fellowship is still there, but there's no relationship. Right? So everyone born into this world, God is still in the world everywhere, but there's no relationship with God, no spiritual relationship. So that's the first death. Second death is when there's no God at all, totally gone, zip. You turn to nothing. That's the lake of fire. Hell 
Gehenna is for the Jews, all right? So that's in Jeremiah 7 and 19. And in the 11 times in the Gospels spoken by Jesus, uh, one time James applied the word Gehenna. It's to apply it like your tongue set on fire, like the fires of the valley in the sun slopes of hell. So, but we all stand before the wretched, uh, judgment seat of Christ to receive our reward or our punishment. Okay, now, um, today we we'll, we actually are reflecting two themes already we heard in a prayer in our first study of the publican and the Pharisee, and then the second uh, one, which is a reprimand, a very serious word of warning given by Jesus to the uh to anyone who does not cancel the debts or forgive the debts of another, especially when your debts have been canceled. So, so these themes will, will actually uh, feature here in the sense of the presence and the absence of repentance from sin or the presence or absence of love for a brother. Right? So uh, let's go into it. Let's read it through and then we'll go uh, through the three kind of larger themes. Luke 15, 11. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his possessions between them. Not many days later, the youngest son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in an extravagantly wasteful lifestyle. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to the one, to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pots that he, the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with anger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Now his older brother, was older, his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called to one Sorry, I should read verse 20. I, the way I organized it. Okay, let's go to 20. And he arose and came to his father. And But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father. Look, these many years have I served you and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And that's why this is perhaps the I would argue the best loved of all the parables um, because it carries such a theme that echoes in all our lives. We can identify ourselves uh, with this prodigal son and we can identify ourselves with this older son. Sometimes we feel holier than 
thou, right? And we can identify ourselves sometimes with the servants who are kind of uh, feeling, you know, look, <laughs> uh, you know, so, and uh, we, we, we kind of just bring the word, right? Or sometimes gossip or talk about things that we, we kind of uh, uh, see that are, gl are glaring at us because they don't fit our normal uh, way of logic. And then, of course, we can identify with this father, right? Um, and hopefully we don't identify ourselves with the pagans who are just, uh, um, you know, doing the kind of things the world loves. And then, of course, um, hiring a worker and giving them be below minimum wage. So, uh, but if we perchance are like that, then it's time to reflect. So over here also we see at least seven distinctives of this father. It's a father who gives in easily, right? Now in ancient culture and now even, if you ask your father for your share of the inheritance, especially if you are not the oldest son, now that's like a curse, right? In Eastern culture, but yet here's a portrait of a father who just gives in without any debate or discussion. And then this father has a good reputation even with the son, right? So it's good uh, when we when we are in a place where even if people disagree with you, they kind of know you, even your children are rebellious, they kind of recognize that you love them, you're generous, even with people who work for you, right? People who who are just uh, laborers. And here, of course, we see a portrait of the father who watches and waits and expectantly. And we know that because he was not only, and then he's very compassionate. He's, this way, remember, splunk, uh, remember the words splunk, splunk nizikov, or even I forget the, the Greek word, the bowels that were stirred, the one that we, we learned in our last parable, right? Splang lin zomai, splang lin zomai, that's the word, splang lin zomai. All right, so compassions that were stirred mercies, and he ran to him, right? He ran to him and embraced him and kissed him. So, and then I, I love uh, number five, the father who entreats. So sometimes someone doesn't want to talk to you and you try and go and talk to them. They are angry, they turn their face on you, you try. It's very tough, you know. Uh, this action, when you are rejected by someone and you try to go and talk to them, uh, it, it takes a lot of courage, I can tell you, and perseverance, but this is a father who does that. And then the father who assures us his fellowship and full inheritance right here, he says, you know, you're with me always. Um, and so the father who can give the full and true assurance uh, and also the full inheritance, and the father who can't wait to celebrate. And that's why you can hear even um, the, in the parables of the faithful servants who multiplied their talents or their uh, uh, minas, and then the master said, you know, well done, good and faithful servant, enter you into the joy of the Lord. You know, the father just can't wait to celebrate. You're coming to full inheritance no matter who you are, and especially because of who you are, if you only believe, you will sit with great glory with Jesus on the throne. Okay, now how do we trust God, our provider? Jehovah Jireh, God, the God who sees and provides, Genesis 22, right? Uh, where Abraham was supposed to sacrifice Isaac, his promised son, as a burnt offering. He says to Isaac's question, well, the Lord is the provider. <laughs> he will see to it. <laughs> because Isaac was wondering, where's the lamb? Where's the goat? Where's the whatever? But God provided a ram. He's <laughs> caught with his horns in the thicket, right? So God will see to it. But can we trust that God will see to it, that he will provide and how do I live this life reflecting the faith of my father? 
See, this father provides everything that the son had when he was living with him. And even when the son chooses to live on his own, he provided him everything. God is good. You know, he allows us to make choices. And oftentimes, 50% of the time, if we look at these two sons, all right, 50% of God's children will go deep into the world. Yes, even Christians. Yes, even Jews. They'll go deep into the world like this son here. All right. So he came to the father, asked for his Uzia, and then the father divided his bios. Now, remember this word bios means the things that support your biological life, just like the woman with the last two mites, copper coins, and threw them into the temple treasury for the love of God. Jesus said that she gave everything that she had to survive her bios, to sustain her bios. So we are talking about real, real thing, the livelihood of the father. He looked at his whole livelihood and he gave the son his portion. That's how good he is. Now, but what happened? He went to a far country, so a foreign land, into the pagan territory. And many Christians, sometimes we get lost into the world, right? We get lost into the customs of the world. And there we begin to scatter. The word is just corbiso, just like the scattering of the grains, right? When you beat it up and then you scatter it so the wind blows and so the chaff is blown apart. So that's scattering. So so just scatter, just scatter, just scatter. Or just like the uh, this son of man who is throwing seeds, right? Even to the byways or to the hardened ground, the paths, right? So carelessly. So the, the seed, of course, won't grow there. So it's like extravagance. Right. And he, he spent it, spent his, uh, the, the estate that he inherited in a profligate. Profligate is a very good word, seldom used. Uh, so this word has been translated into even riot or dissipation. Right. Uh, but the root of this word is just, uh, you know, extra extravagant wastefulness of things, time and talents. So you and I, we are sons of God. Don't waste, don't let your thoughts be hijacked by thinking a lot of thoughts that don't pertain to matters of justice, righteousness, steadfast love, right? So focus on that. Even when looking at public situation, don't populate your thoughts with just worries and just speculations. If you, if, if you hear something that's alarming, go and check it out. If somebody sends you something and they tell you it's very important, at least check it out. Go through it. Don't be lazy because laziness is also a form of wastefulness. It's a form of assortia, right? So don't leave the asostos, asostos lifestyle, meaning you're wasting even the talents, even your faculties. God gave you a good brain. Use it to think like a true scholar because you are a true student. Don't think that, oh, you know, I don't want to, I, I don't want to have this knowledge because it's, uh, it's, it's just, you know, I, it's irrelevant. Well, that is a source here. That is like wastefulness. So don't just think only that uh, you are flung into the world and just be very sinless and godless. Now, remember, we are talking about an orientation and a lifestyle of scattering your talents, your abilities. Uh, so, so don't immediately think of it as uh, just a, a question of sexual immorality or going into drugs or going into you know crimes. All right, we are talking about even every day that the Jew or the Christian who is not careful, you can be reflecting that wastefulness cultures. Food, you know, some of us grew up, and even up to this day, we, we just can't throw away food. And you know, sometimes people around me are a little bit shocked, right? If the cheese, I will cut off whatever, or whatever food that is a bit moldy at the top, if it's still good, I smell it, I just skim off the, but that's part, partly ingrained into me and maybe in some of you. Um, why? Because this is an understanding of, you know, yeah, you may be able to afford this and afford that, or afford this or afford that, but no wastefulness allowed. So develop it. 
uh, as a discipline life. You see here. So I put in the uh, what do you call the three passages that uses the word assortia, other than this fourth time where it's used as an adverb form here in Luke chapter 15, verse 13. So three other times this word shows up in the noun form in uh, Ephesians 5.15 that takes us into... Uh, oh, okay, let me just go first point here. I wanted to comment on this, a holy calling. Now, this man, this younger son, went out and hide himself. The word collar, think of a collar. Right? Uh, think of a collar. Collar is the word cling. Just like Jesus said, when you, I send you two by two into every town of Israel to preach the kingdom of heaven, it is right here and you must repent. And if they don't listen to your message, get out of that town and, you know, don't even let the dust that clings on to your sandal remain. So shake off the dust that clings on. So that's the word cling. Or, or just like when, uh, when Jesus was quoting about the husband leaving the parents' home and clinging on to the wife, right? That's the word cling right here. So it's yoking, right? So unfortunately, he yoked himself uh, to be a, a hired servant, right? To be a hired servant, to be indentured, to be enslaved, and so that his very livelihood, to even to go on biologically, needed that relationship, which was the poorest of poor relationship because he was not even paid enough to eat the food given to pigs. But of course, as a good Jewish boy or a good Israelite, he remembered that. He remembered his calling, holy calling. So you can go to uh, uh, Leviticus, that holiness chapter that, that begins all the holiness covenant talk in the book of Leviticus from 11 on. In chapter 10, God said to Aaron, don't weep for your boys who were just burned to death by me. Everyone who approaches me, you must let your children and children know. They must know to differentiate between holy and unholy and clean and unclean. And apparently this lesson stayed, right? So in chapter 11, he goes on to say, be you holy for I'm holy. And there are clean things that you don't touch because you are holy people or unclean things you don't touch, and clean animals you can eat. And uh, so this boy, he actually have a common sense. So why do I say that? Yes, he went to look after the pigs and fed the pigs, but he never ate the pigs. So according to the law in Leviticus 11 and repeated in Deuteronomy 14, God reminded them as Moses retold commands of God. He said, you know, you are God's chosen people. You are holy. You are God's people and you are holy. And so don't touch the unclean things, including the animal that split the hose but does not chew the cud. And that's the pig. The pig is being mentioned. So not only the hooves is, must be split, they must be chewing the cud. So they must eat and the food must be chewed from, from one chamber of the stomach to another. I suppose that's what it meant. So, um, so this boy actually didn't break the, the Torah on holiness. You can touch it as long as it's alive. So when he's feeding the pigs, they are alive. Uh, let me just read uh, for you Leviticus 11 uh, from verses uh, 6 and 7. Of the hair, because it chews the cut, does not have a part of hoof, hoof foot. It is unclean for you. The pig. Because although it is a hoofed animal with cloven hooves, it does not chew the cut and is unclean for you. You are not to eat the flesh of these or even touch that dead carcasses. They are unclean for you. So the prohibition is not to touch their dead bodies. All right. So technically, according to the scripture here and repeated in Deuteronomy 14, he didn't Touch the dead. So we, we are not told he touched the dead pig. So, but, and he had a sense of the faith of the father. So he remembered. He came to himself. This word is very, very good. Agarto. So when he came to himself, it's an idiomatic expression. That means he's like woken up. Wow. My father, the faith and faithfulness of my father, even his hired servants, even his miss Theos. And later on, we'll encounter word reward. All right, it's from the same root, mistos, mistheos. 
this rewarded hired servants, this paid servants have more than enough bread. My father is a generous father and I perish here with hunger. So he came to his senses. He came to himself. And this is very important. Many Christians, many Jews caught in the world, caught in profligate, wild, you know, just worldly values have to come to a moment of coming to themselves before you can really come into the real faith of the Father. But And so when we pray week after week for our children, for the younger generation, and for the children of the world, we are trying to keep this faith and this, this uh, protect the faith down every generation. And we must trust in God that when we do that, when we walk in faith and faithfulness, and when we function that way, um, we are uh, part of the blessing of the Lord according to his name that was revealed in Exodus 34. Uh, his name, uh, he's full of grace and compassion because his name is Chesed and Emet, steadfast love and faithfulness and truth. And then he abounds to a thousand generations in mercies, forgiving even uh, those uh, who are under that blessing. But then those who live under that curse, who don't carry that faith and faithfulness to the third and fourth generations, the sins and iniquities of the fathers will be visited. And so remember the contrast. God is so good that he would bless your faithfulness to a thousand generations, meaning it's so powerful you live on. But if you happen to sin and that household failed, are sinful and not faithful, it will affect the immediate household of four generations, great-grandparent, grandparent, parent, and child, right? So that's a typical household in Middle Eastern culture and even in many cultures today. So the sins is located within that household. That's the goodness of God, even in who he is, proclaimed in his name. Now, um, we learned in Ephesians 5.15, um, okay, let's go to First Peter four one first. A suffering result. First Peter talks a lot about suffering for the will of God, and especially because they have entered the very last days of the end times of Israel. And he said that from the opening chapter, we are just waiting for Jesus to be revealed and our salvation, because we are going to be rescued from this Holocaust to come. And uh, he said it in the opening scriptures. And then he goes on to tell them that, look, judgment has already begun. Can't you see? Things are happening. The day of the Lord is already around us. And it's right. We are already entering into that. And so, so endure suffering and learn to suffer with a strong resolve. They are suffering for the purpose of God. And, not, and so even if you cannot live and don't live out the earthly human passions like the Gentiles do, but live out the will of God. So what is the will of God? It is to do or act justly. It is to love family, love and excel in, and to walk humbly, learning and loving God. Micah 6, 8, Matthew 23, 23, Luke 11, 42. And of course, don't join in the same asostos, asostos, okay, asotia, asotia. And then Ephesians 5, we have this uh, passage again. We are to walk wisely, not as fools, but as wise. So if we walk in a wasteful, extravagant manner in our life, wasting our talents, wasting our abilities, wasting what God has given to us, then we are foolish. Redeem the time because the days are evil. Uh, understand the will of the Lord. And don't drunk with, be drunk with wine, wherein it's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Again, this words, so excessive. In those days, they drink a lot of wine. And in some cultures today, they drink a lot of wine. In Alaska, they drink a lot of wine because wine is cheaper than the bottled water. All right. But even if you have to drink more wine for necessity or whatever, don't drink excessive amounts. So that's the word, a sortier. But what do we do? We can be extravagant and we, we can be, we can be, you can say, just splurge on what? On 
speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Yesterday I was, uh, was it Friday? Yeah, I went to the bank for jam. And then there's this lady, I've never seen her before, and she's always singing. And I said, you have a, you have a song in your heart? And she laughed. I said, yes, you know, uh, I'm always doing that. That's wonderful, right? In my heart there rings a melody. And so when we meditate, especially we go to the words of scriptures, and it could be the book of Psalms. A, a lot of time our mind is taken to the book of Psalms because that's where all the songs and hymns are. And we are talking to the Lord, right? So that's by yourself. And then unto God, you can split yourself unto God by giving thanks always to God in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So be very, very thankful for all things like Paul says in another place as well. And then, of course, the third thing with one another. And so Christians who don't come into fellowship or who think that they can be islands <laughs> or islands apart, don't really understand that you can't fulfill this with one another. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. When we come together, we fearfully come to his word, come under his tutelage, come in his instruction, big or small, doesn't matter. When, you, when time co comes to listen to the word of God, we listen fearfully, reverentially, and receiving the word of God. That's how we have a spirit simpler or simple spirit-filled lifestyle. And this discipline life, of course, uh, is a requirement of church leadership. And of course, it's reflected in all these passages as well. Right, let's move on to focusing the second and third uh, themes that are central to our calling. Is what is our real relationship our relationship with the things of the world, temporary. You know, we, we have one cell phone after another, right? So this is my older cell phone. This is my newer cell phone. And it's already due for many months. I haven't gone to get a new one because it's still working well. Uh, so uh, somehow the light came so on. Wow. Uh, anyway, um, so it's temporary. And I, I have a, a bunch of older cell phones that some are not working. Some are working poorly. Right? So these are temporal relationships. But the lasting relationship will be those built with or through a relationship with the Father. So in Christ, we have a lasting relationship. And in the values of heaven, we have a great lasting relationship. Estia, uh, Estia. Right. Uh, sorry, uh, her friend came by. Okay, anyway... Um, so the two sons have, have, have their relationship evaluated before this father, right? So the father is that stable rock of all ages, whereas the two sons are at different places in their relationship with the father. The father tells the, the one son or tells the other son the same things. He has not changed. He is that same father who is generous, who is giving, who is forgiving, uh, who is wise, uh, who, who has it all planned and purposed out. But it is the sons, and that's you and I now. And we can really uh, fall into these two categories. So the, the ones who are more what we call uh, conforming or more obedient, like what he said, all right? Uh, this son said that, you know, uh, this son said, I've served you. I never disobeyed your command. So he's a good son, right? He's a good son, but yet he, he has not come uh, into a depth of relationship that gives him that understanding of the true heart of the father. That's all. So he's not a bad son at all. And, you know, of course, he gets a bit jealous and envious and and complaining. So, yeah, you know, understand, understandable. But he can do much better, right? And hopefully after this episode, you know, uh, with any one of us, we can do better, right? So uh, in the parable, they don't have a life. It's just a parable. So don't expect that son to do better. <laughs> but we, the real living bodies who need 
our biological existence from the daily provisions of the Father. Give us this day our daily bread. And he has given us, like he gives the servant, much more than they needed. Many of us have a lot more than we ever needed in several lifetimes. All right. So, um, and then the other question is, what about inheritance? Am I willing to wait out my rich inheritance in Christ? And we have a ton of scriptures telling us about our rich inheritance in Jesus. So, or am I, am I impatient? You know, sometimes we live as though that if we didn't experience certain things in this life, we have not lived and, and we are unhappy, we are dissatisfied. Or sometimes we live as though that we need another 1,000 turkey dinners and 100 lobsters and all that, right? We live with that attitude. We're not willing to wait out our rich inheritance in Christ. It's not wrong if you can afford it, you can eat turkey every day if you can afford it, right? But be sure that you are you are not just eating while other people are suffering in need. And I'm very thankful and all of you walking with me, the First Nations family, you know, very often during the week, last week too, a few times, we have to help various First Nations uh, that we know. Uh, and some of them are very good Christians. They just don't have uh, the means to take care of certain things because that's how it is. The Father provides in this household, and so uh, we are the extension of the generosity of the Father as a house. So I'm really thankful and proud of you for uh, participating richly in this all these years, uh, all these years. Um, and, you know, because we know that this world is really not our permanent home, and we all pass through, we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And there in Romans chapter 14 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we are told that we will get our reward and hopefully little punishment because, because Jesus is going to judge us by our instructions. Since we say we follow Jesus and that he's the Christ, he's our Messiah, he will definitely judge us much more than even to the Jew who only did not want to acknowledge Jesus. So Christians' punishment would be heavier than the Jew if we do poorly. In other words, we do wickedly in the eyes of Jesus. And some months ago, we studied the, the parable of the four servants in Luke chapter 12, right? Four Christian disciple servants and how the punishments are greater even for Christian disciples than for the Jewish brethren who are not Christians. Okay, so now we also wanted to look at this son. Now, this son who awakens to himself, I will rise to go to my father, father of sin. Look at how he was motivated. You know, some people are so unmotivated then you'll never come into the heart of the Father. You'll never really come back to the Father's house in a real way because you're still caught in the world. You're still not awakened to your senses. And even when you're awakened to your senses, you feel that you, you're not motivated. You're, you're too weak and, and you just can't do it. Well, we cannot have that attitude. And it must be humbling. In other words, he must swallow, his, swallow the humble pie, except that, you know, he... He had to deal with himself. He didn't have enough food to eat, let alone humble pie. But he had to humble himself and force himself to go back, especially when we do wrong. And then we need help from the one who we have wronged. Well, that is the humblest of pies that we have to take, right? And then, of course, he had to be proactive. He had to think what he's going to say and then motivated enough, then start walking or crawling or hitchhiking his way back to the Father. Now, oftentimes this prodigal son has been made into the son who repents. Okay, grant, there is repentance. But really, it's more of a realism. It's more of a, a realistic check on his own situation that caused him to turn 
or change his mind, right, to repent. So don't put the, the cart before the horse, right? So when the rubber hits the road, and oftentimes it is good uh, that the rubber hits the road for us, that we are in a, between the, uh, the deep blue sea and a hard rock, right? So we are trapped. And then we look at our circumstances and look at our real condition. When we take a real good look, then we wake up into a realistic assessment of where we are. Many, many people in the world and many Jews and many Christians live in a sleep state, right? Or uh, if not actively dreaming, certainly not really waking up fully. You know, sometimes when, when you're tired and you wake up in the middle of the night and you wake up, and, and I've done that once in a while, I will bump into the wall. <laughs> I'll bump into this, I'll bump into that, right? Because you are kind of uh, in a slightly drunk state, right? Dissipated state, you could say, wasted state. And so that's what it is. So really... Uh, to truly repent, first we must truly wake up. Many people don't truly repent. It's just a formula. You don't really change your mind, change your heart. And it's because you have not taken a good look at your own circumstance and you decided that, no, I don't want this, I want that. All right? So we have to make a decisive choice Take the world, give me Jesus. If I have to die, I will die. Today, in the face of great social injustice everywhere around us, great authoritarian bullying by people with money, people with authority, institutions, where do you and I stand? Do you stand with those who have been persecuted, those who have been hurt, those who are crying out for help, those who are crying out to be heard for justice? If you don't, then what? All right. If I don't, then what? We are not truly looking at the real things happening around us. We just want to hear, and many Christians, even good ones, the imagination is hijacked by a false realism. And therefore, you can never come to a true place of reflecting our relationship with the Father. Right? So this is the time for you. When you hear of somebody who is hurt or injured, do your best, pray for them, or if they want to be hurt, pass their message around. Don't censor it. Don't censor it. I've been censored a lot in this past year <laughs> because I, I send testimonies of people who needed to be hurt, and that stirred up a lot of anger, and some cut themselves from me. Okay. I won't cut myself from you, but if you choose to do so, you are coming against the very calling of who you are in Christ Jesus. So it's a warning to everyone. It's a very, very serious warning because we think that we can just go back into a more comfortable way of framing reality because it agrees with us. No, the word of God is supreme. We are governed and we are ruled by the word of God. And even though we cannot reach to that level, we are still reaching. And we don't turn and take on another word or defy his word. All right, so this is very serious. Okay, let's come uh, to conclude all this. Uh, I don't know how much time I did, but I'm trying to uh, bring my messages within an hour or Hopefully, we can get to 45 minutes and still get what the Lord wants for us each Sunday. But I, I, I pray and trust that, you know, I send you the PDF as well. And so you, you go and uh, revisit these scriptures or you can go to the YouTube when it's mounted and re-listen if you have to. So that you, uh, you truly grow in your knowledge and grace as a kingly Christian. All right. So... We need to contrast here the, the prosperity, prosperity gospel, which is really the larger part of the Christian church, is preaching the prosperity gospel. We should change it to prosperity, go spend. Go spend. 
you know, on this life. But really, that's what it is. We have turned the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, which is a kingdom of, like John was told in, in Revelation 1.9, right? It's a kingdom under tribulation, right? Because it's a kingdom that requires endurance because of Jesus. It's a kingdom, eternal kingdom. So it needs endurance. There's no easy street for the Christian, right? Yes, you may have what you call pro be provided with plenty and you don't have to worry about daily food and all that. Uh, but it's not an easy street when you begin to stand up and stand out with a testimony that that convicts the world of sin and judgment, right? And the devil of judgment and convicts the world of the righteousness of God in heaven. John 16, when Jesus told the disciples who obeyed him that he would give them the spirit of truth, which will bring the power of convicting the world and those who don't believe in him, of sin and those who don't believe in him and of the devil, right? So, so that's where we are. So resist the prosperity gospel in all its forms. You know, many people, and they go through a phase, they want to go to churches, especially when you are younger, perhaps, or when you are easily moved by emotions. You want to go to a church which can sing louder, which can shout louder, which can dance better. And you think that is not repeating what those false prophets about at Mount Carmel, and they will even cut themselves. So if you think that if I only bleed a little bit more, <laughs> you know, perhaps... Uh, God will hear, God will listen, God is happy. That's not the covenantal faith, all right? You can't jump a little higher or sing a little louder and, you know, participate in all that, spending all your emotions and all this and not being spent for others and for the kingdom of God, right? The gospel of the kingdom is one of perseverance, it's one in which we have tr the true peace of God and the true joy of God, not just for ourselves, but for the family, for the nations of the world and the true righteousness of God. So right now, be rebuked, every one of us, including myself, right? Where we are. So right now is a perfect time. There are people in need. People are losing their jobs because they choose to believe Witnesses who have lost their jobs, who are credible witnesses concerning the vaccines. And so it should be a freedom to choose. But yet, for the first time that we can see, governments don't even care if they lose 20% of the workforce. Why don't they care? Because at the back, there's probably engines fueling their confidence. Those were the days when even a, a little bit of unhappiness, a little bit of workforce affected, every government will work to, okay, okay, let's make sure that the workforce is not disturbed. So things are unnatural, things are wrong, things are shaken. Look back over the all the messages in this one year. They are very, very prophetically in line with what is happening. Foundations of the earth are shaken, moved. So don't you... Right? Don't you or I participate in the sins of the worldly thinking right now, in the injustices. Respect everyone, protect everyone, protect everyone's livelihood. The vaccines are good for one purpose, but they also have certain secondary and even dangerous and deadly, uh, uh, what do you call, effects, right? So, Understand that and make your choice. Most of my family members have taken the vaccines. Okay, that's their choice. But so, but there's some and some of my my friends and others that, that are out there in the world, they, they want to keep it safe, including uh, those who provide uh, help for many years now, upfront. Nurses, doctors, the very best of them are losing their jobs because they don't want to take the vaccine yet. It's still in an experimental stage. So you and I have no business 
to be part of the overarching, uh, what do you call, uh, tide of pressure upon those who want to choose their freedom to choose. But there are Christians, and I know good ones, who are part of that force trying to push people to do that. I think that's clearly wrong and unjust. There's no question about it. So please, I don't, I don't wish any one of us to participate. But give an ear to hear the cries of the victims and pray for them and see what you can do to, to let their, their cries be heard. Don't be afraid. Stand out. Be mugged. Because you and I, we are truly kingdom subjects. Now, Jesus says that those who are looking for temporary earthly rewards, they have their reward in full. So Matthew chapter 6, right? whether you are in the act of giving, or you are in the act of praying, or you are in the act of fasting, three very serious topics. Don't put your eyes in what is temporary, in the praise of men. All right, in the recognition uh, that, oh, you are somebody very holy or whatever. All right, and uh, so Jesus says, if that's what you're looking for, you've got your reward. So expect many Jews and many Christians to have much less reward than they would have given the good that they do in fasting, in praying, in giving. You know, Jews are very good at giving and very good at praying and very good at, not as good as fasting as Christians, I would say. They, they only need to fast once a year. But look, even these things, you can lose much of your reward if you want them right now. You know, Jesus walked around with the greatest prayer, with the greatest, you can say, fasted life, and with the, the greatest good. But what did he draw around himself? The nobodies. Can you imagine the greatest of teachers? And he had not even one outstanding student to really come close to him. Can you imagine that? But it gives hope to us, right? All of us, because we are not outstanding people. We are all like the sinners and the, the, you know, the publicans and the diseased people. And we are all in this small family. And, and we are not the very richest and the most famous. We are, not, we are not all that. So we get to live out the calling of Jesus uh, vocationally, right? When we cling on to the word, when we follow Jesus everywhere, he does any of these things and give him glory. When we provoke one another to love as we meet, right? And when we continue faithfully walking with one another. So Paul says in the great love chapter of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13 and the final verse, these three remain faith, what we were talking about, hope, the inheritance, and the love, the relationship that we talked about. Of course, the greatest of these is love. Without love, without the showing of love of the Father and the receiving of love from the sons, then nothing else has a purpose. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you that you allow us once again to uh, go and encounter you in your Son in his teaching. And we pray that uh, like how the psalmist describes and Jesus really lifts it out is that, Lord, I delight, we can say, I delight to do your will, O God. Your word, your Torah is in my heart. So may that be reflected in each one of us now and always. Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance before you as he grants you the joy of the Father in the awakening of the sons into the rich presence and inheritance of the Father. 
now and always. Amen. Amen.